Kicking off at number 5, The Divine Wind. And this one in particular is such a tale of historical significance that we just have to talk about it purely from an etymological perspective. Because you know that we all love words, right? Well, for those of you that do know, the term kamikaze actually translates to divine wind in Japanese, which is pretty metal anyway, but the actual reason behind that is something else entirely. Now, over in the rich and intricate history of Asia, the Mongol Empire are a pretty big deal, although they are more inexplicably tied to the ancient kingdom of China than ancient Japan. However, that is not to say that the Japanese didn't have their own Mongol horde to face down, it's just, well, something incredibly interesting happened, and not only once, but twice. Let me explain. In 1274, Kublai Khan of the Mongol Empire sent a massive navy to conquer Japan with an estimated 30,000 to 40,000 men made up of Chinese and Korean warriors, as well as the highly feared Mongol troops. The navy set off in the autumn of that year, harrying the northern coastal islands of Kyushu. However, once the main fleet arrived and began to anchor in Hataka Bay, as the legend goes, a force of nature struck. A divine wind, a huge typhoon, emerged from the depths of the ocean, sinking a third of the Mongol fleet and sending the rest of them home. It was certainly a force of nature and it saved the Japanese ultimately from ruin. But the same thing happened again to everyone's divine amazement. Not happy with his failure, Kublai Khan sent a second fleet several years later in 1281, comprised of over 4,500 vessels and some 140,000 men. Again, sailing in August, the fleet made the once familiar voyage towards Japan and again, this time, the divine wind struck once more. I mean, obviously there is a pinch of salt needed to this, as is the formation of a Japanese legend, but the symbology alone is startling. Again, the fleet was devastated by a far more powerful typhoon than the last, and over half of the evading force was cast into the bay, perishing in the violent waters of the Pacific. The divine wind, which once again, as the legend tells it, saved Japan from the Mongol Empire. However, there is a caveat to this story. During their time preparing for the second Mongol invasion, a 20 kilometer wall was ordered to be constructed as a means of defense. Despite holding off the Mongol Empire, down to the divine act of the wind, the construction of this wall absolutely crippled the kingdom economically, ultimately leading to the shogunate's downfall. Hmm. Maybe there's a lesson there. Coming in at number four, Yasuke. And I'm gonna be honest, guys, this one is so awesome, and why there hasn't been a movie made about it yet is anyone's guess. But hold that thought, because actually, as of this year, rumors have stirred that a one Chadwick Boseman, AKA the Black Panther himself, will be playing the first African samurai in history. Really, the epic tale of Yasuke, whilst being a startling reminder of the time, is also one of the most incredible moments in history, and it is a story that just needs to be told. You see, in 1579, a Jesuit missionary by the name of Alessandro Valley bought an African slave of unknown origin with him on his travels to Japan. Now, historical records aren't exactly clear as to where he was born, but it has been proposed that he may have been from Mozambique, Angola, Ethiopia, or perhaps even Portugal. His real name, too, is not known, but as far as Japanese records are concerned, they called him Yasuke, believed to be a phonetic approximation of his real name, which was possibly Yasufe or Isaac. Whilst on their travels through the kingdom, Yasuke was eventually called to an audience with Oda Nobunaga, the most powerful Japanese warlord of the time, who was captivated by Yasuke strength and size, and was so awestruck by this figure from a foreign land that he made him his personal retainer and bodyguard. And well, from then on, Yasuke pretty much pursued the path of the warrior in Japanese society, and he was pretty damn good at it, eventually learning the language and often speaking fluently with the warlord as a trusted counsel. In 1581, Yasuke was elevated to the rank of samurai and stationed at Nobunaga's stronghold and crowning glory, Azuchi Castle, where he served by his side as his personal sword bearer. Eventually, when Nobunaga was later betrayed by Akechi Mitsuhide and his army, a huge battle erupted at Honoji in Kyoto, where Yusuke stood side by side with the samurai warriors, willing to fight to the death. Sadly, they were defeated, and after Nobunaga was forced to commit seppuku, ceremonial suicide, Yusuke escaped, however, and briefly served under Nobunaga's son, until he too was attacked by Mitsuhide and committed suicide. Eventually, Yusuke surrendered his sword to the pursuing warlord, and unaccustomed to a samurai surrendering rather than ceremonial seppuku, he ordered Yusuke to return to the Jesuit mission in Kyoto. After that, Yusuke's fate is unclear. He seemingly faded back into the sands of time, where only his legend remained. And hopefully, an awesome movie. In our third spot today, we have the ancient Egyptian treasures. Rumor has it that a number of treasures or artifacts from ancient Egypt are cursed. I mean, you all know about King Tut's curse. Well, there are a couple of items in the Smithsonian from ancient Egypt that are definitely haunted. For starters, we have the scarab. This scarab is believed to be from King Tut's tomb. For starters, it is believed that bad luck will fall on anyone who handles King Tut's body or other artifacts in his tomb. Everything in there is believed to be cursed by King Tut himself. I'm sure you've heard of the story of Howard Carter and his team that excavated the tomb. After 
after doing so, several of the people involved died suddenly and mysteriously. So it's believed that this scarab is cursed along with the other items there. And then we have the mummified cat head. Yeah, you heard me. Now this one actually isn't from King Tut's tomb, but a woman named Mab B. Nylon donated a cat's head. Yeah, just the head. Who knows where the body is? Hey, maybe she kept it for herself and it's on display in her house. I'm not gonna judge. Anyways, this creepy thing is a preserved mummified cat's head wrapped in linen. Inside contains a real cat skull. Well, according to a number of workers, they have seen a ghostly cat apparition move around this display. This damn ghost cat is probably out looking for the rest of its body. This cat has also been seen wandering the halls and in several other exhibits as well. Moving on at number two, we have the Black Aggie. This all started back in the 1800s when a woman named Marianne Hooper Adams, known by her friends as Clover, sunk into a terrible depression. As a result, she drank some of her photography developing chemicals and took her own life. After her death, her husband commissioned a sculptor to make a memorial statue of her. It was named the Adams Memorial and later Black Aggie. But because of how it looked, people called it grief. And that's when this creepy legend surrounding it was born. Legend goes that if you stare into her eyes long enough, they'll open up and start glowing red. Those that see her eyes will either be killed by her or she will cause you to go blind. Not only that, if you sit on the statue's lap at midnight, then you will die within two weeks. It's also said that pregnant ladies should never go near her. If they do, she will cause them to miscarry. Of course, this is just a creepy legend, right? Well, supposedly there's real life stories of this haunted statue taking people's lives. One man put a cigarette out on the statue's hand and he was later found dead with a gunshot wound to the head. Another man was found dead at the foot of the statue and no one knows his cause of death. Now, you may be wondering how the statue got to the Smithsonian. Well, because of the legend, a lot of people were breaking into the cemetery at night to visit it, and it was often vandalized. So the family donated it to the museum where it remains to this day. And in our number one spot today, we have the Hope Diamond. This is a very beautiful diamond from India. But here's the thing, it was stolen from India, and then a curse was placed on it. Back in 1792, the Hope Diamond was part of a Hindu statue. It was one of the idol's eyes. And then somebody went in and took the 115 carat diamond out. Upon discovering that the diamond was stolen, priests put a curse on it. The curse was said to affect anyone that put their greedy little paws on it, which turned out to be a lot of people over the years. And guess what? Bad luck befell to every single one of its owners. It's said that the man who stole the diamond shortly came down with a raging fever and died shortly after. Legend continues on saying that his body was ravaged by wolves. Continuing on, King Louis XIV bought the stone and had it recut in 1673. He died of gangrene, and all his legitimate kids died early on in life. Then we have Marie Antoinette. Apparently she wore it as well. And we all know how bad things ended for her. Another story involved an heiress named Evelyn Walsh McLean. She bought the Hope Diamond and everyone around her started to die mysteriously. First it was her mother-in-law, then her son, then her husband left her and later died in a mental hospital, and then her daughter. She later sold the diamond to get rid of this curse. That's not even half the people affected by this diamond, like the list goes on and on. Now the haunted diamond is on display at the Smithsonian. Hopefully no one will ever try to steal it because we don't need to relive its curse over again. Number 5. The Busby Stoop Chair You know, when you think of a haunted object, I don't think your mind tends to go to a regular old armchair. Maybe dolls, gems, paintings, not to spoil the rest of the list, but I don't tend to think of home furnishings as being particularly cursed. Well then I guess it's because you haven't heard the Busby Stoop Chair that holds the bold distinction of being London's most haunted chair. Isn't that something to put on a resume? Thomas Busby was a common crook in the 17th century. He ran a counterfeit money operation with his father-in-law, but he was also known to be a general hoodlum, thief, brawler, and the kind of guy that would have rubbed elbows with Tom Shelby. It's said that a violent altercation with his father-in-law over a disagreement about their criminal enterprises led to Bubsy's associate dying by his hands. Busby was sent to the gallows, but had recorded requested to visit his favorite pub one last time for a meal. He sat himself down in his favorite chair, ate his dinner, and claimed that if anyone ever sat in his chair after his death, he would make sure to haunt them. He would be hanged the next day. 
It would seem that his claim would prove to be true, because in the years since Busby's passing, the chair did bring mysterious misfortune. The first striking occurred in 1894, when a chimney seep sat in the chair with a friend one evening and heard the story of the Busby haunting. He thought nothing of it, and after leaving the bar, passed out in the street. The next morning, he was found hanging from the gallows. During the Second World War, airmen used the pub as a hotspot, and the rumors began to sprout again about the Busby chair being haunted. An urban legend of an airman who sat in it and crashed his plane the next day was whispered in the wind amongst men. The owner of the pub, worried about the evil contained within a chair, rightfully so, eventually donated it to the Thirsk Museum in the UK, where it's hung five feet off the floor from the ceiling, just to ensure no one ever makes the mistake of trying to get too comfy in that cursed chair. And my ghouls and my goblins, if you'd like to hear more scary stuff, you don't have to go anywhere at all. Click through for hundreds of videos about cursed objects, aliens, cryptids, creatures, ghosts, ghouls, goblins, and way, way, way more. Stay subscribed and creep on creeping on. Number four, Robert the doll. Now, every good list of cursed objects should definitely include at least one cursed doll, I think, just for good measure. It's called Annabelle's Claws. Dolls are just inherently a little bit scary when they're not being used for make believe or having tea parties. And they're especially scary when they carry a series of unfortunate urban legends with them, like the case of one Robert the Doll. Maybe you've even heard of Robert the Doll, as he's actually pretty famous as far as cursed dolls go out there. It's, it's kind of Annabelle, Robert, the rest of them. Robert's been haunting for over a century. He used to be the property of one Robert Jean Otto. Now, although he shared a name with the doll, he preferred to be called Otto. Maybe because the doll took it. Otto received Robert as a young boy from his grandfather, who obtained it through unknown means, as trying to trace it has been fruitless. No toy company has ever been found to have produced it. Otto loved Robert and had an active imagination to a degree that unsettled his parents. He would refer to the doll in first person and brought it everywhere with him, even dressed it in his clothing. That's kind of odd, but it's still little kid behavior. Otto would say he could hear Robert talk to him and would see him move. And children who passed the Otto estate when walking by would claim they saw Robert in the windows, watching them from up high, appearing and disappearing. Otto would blame all mishaps on Robert. Injuries, breaks around the house, accidents, anything that happened, it was because either Robert had told him to do it or Robert had done it. Kind of understandably, this behavior deeply worried Otto's parents. Otto kept Robert up until the day of his death in 1974, where he then traveled from home to home and collector to collector, causing a path of misfortune everywhere he went, until eventually getting himself incarcerated in the Key West Art and Historical Society, where he's now kept under a very tight lock and key and has become the museum's most popular attraction. Visitors even leave him offerings, little goodie bags, and even write letters asking for protection from him or a little aid cursing others. Employees of the museum say that sometimes they feel uncomfortable around him, and have noticed the chill in the air by his exhibit or electrical malfunctions near where he sits. It's been said that they need to stay on his good side, lest they provoke his wrath. So I just want to throw this out there, Robert. I've actually, I've always been a huge fan of all that you do, and that little sailor outfit is just chef's kiss. That looks great. Great on you. <laughs> Matches your hair. Next up at number three, you are an Yemen. And of course, it can't be a list without ancient Japanese history, unless there's a good old fashioned ghost story involved. And this one is perhaps the most legendary of them all. A tale of betrayal, murder, and ghostly revenge, adapted over 30 times in Japanese history and cinema, and one of the underlying tales that forms the very unique aspect of Japanese horror to this day. Yotsuya Kaiden, but more specifically, the story of Yua and Tamiyan Yemen. As the legend goes, Yua was a charming young woman who lived in a small town in Japan alongside her lover, Yemen. And although the pair were poor and had little money, they loved each other very much. Eventually, they married, they had a child, and they were content in their standing in life. However, as time went on, the young Yemen became angry and depressed, surrounded by his reminder of his failures and his lack of prospects. Soon, he grew to hate Yua and instead began an affair with a rich young woman by the name of Yume. As time passed at the prospect of marrying into Yume's family for the wealth and riches, Yemen plotted to secretly poison his own wife. One night over dinner, after he poisoned his wife's food, Yoa pleaded with him to tell her what was wrong. The pair argued until late in the evening, and then, dejected and confused, Yoa eventually consumed the poison, and Yemen watched as it slowly did its job. However, it didn't work as intended, and instead of killing her, it grossly disfigured Yoa, contorting her into a shadow of her former self. Yemen was too much of a coward to finish the job, and Yoa lived in pain and torment. And then, one evening, after taking his wife for a walk, he pushed her off a cliff when he realized that 
no one was around to notice. In public, he played the part of the victim spending all of his money on a marital and pious funeral, knowing that his money troubles would soon be a thing of the past. Well, eventually on his wedding day to the wealthy Yume, when Yemen lifted the veil of his new bride, instead he saw his ex-wife's contorted and twisted face, poisoned by his own hand. It screamed betrayal at him, and in a panic, Yemen drew his sword and swung at the ghostly apparition. And then a severed head collapsed and rolled across the floor of the wedding ceremony, but it wasn't his ghostly ex-wife's head, but instead, the head of his new bride. Coming in at number two, The Standing Death of Benke. Wait, come on, you know what I'm gonna say, right? That's a pretty awesome title for a death metal album. Just saying, guys, another one to add to the pile. But really, the unbelievable tale of The Standing Death of Benke is just as awesome as it sounds. Between 1180 and 1185, a series of bloodthirsty and complex battles were fought in Japan, a period of history known as the Genpei War. Now, during this time, many lives were lost, but a legendary hero of Japanese folklore emerged. Minamoto no Yoshitsune, the renowned warrior that defeated the Haika clans. But this this story isn't so much concerned with Yoshisune, but instead his most loyal of followers. Mushishibo Benkei, a man of mysterious birth who lived his life first as a monk, then a mountain hermit, and eventually the most badass warrior to have ever lived. He was one of the few men who would eventually earn the respect of Yoshisune, and he did that by being an all-around unrelenting badass, really. But it's not exactly in his life where Benkei achieved immortality, but instead in his death. Eventually, after the Genpei War had been settled for many years, history of course decided to repeat itself, and the same echoes of betrayal stirred throughout the warring clans of Japan. After falling out of favour with his half-brother, Yoshisune retreated and sought refuge with the powerful northern Fujiwara clan for several years. By 1187 though, the patron of the Fujiwara clan had passed away of old age, and Yoshisune's half-brother forced the clan into succumbing to his will. Eventually, his residence was surrounded by an impossibly large army, and yet one man stood in their way. Benkei, the final loyal warrior and follower of Yoshisune, who guarded the one bridge that lay between his leader and the bloodthirsty army. It is said that during the battle, Benkei defeated more than 300 warriors single-handedly, allowing time for his leader to commit seppuku in his residence. Witnessing the unbridled bloodbath, the opposing force were terrified to approach, and instead began firing from a distance with a volley of arrows. One by one, arrow after arrow, punch of Benkei, but still, he didn't fall. As the legend goes, after the terrified army finally worked up the courage to come near him, they had found that Benke had died from his many arrow wounds, yet he had died standing on his feet. And finally, coming in at number one spot, the 47 Ronin. And if you thought that the story of Benkei couldn't be topped, of course it can, because come on, this is Japan. Now, I don't say this lightly, but the legend of the 47 Ronin is perhaps one of the most important stories in Japanese culture, and certainly the most definitive of what it means to be a samurai. It exemplifies many traits that have been carved out of the thousands of years of Japanese history. And of course, as is the case with many important cultural tales, it has been adapted hundreds of times in both literature and cinema to varying degrees of success. And yes, I'm looking at you, Keanu Reeves. In the year 1701, the daimyo of the Eiko Domain, which was a sort of warlord, was a warrior named Asano Naganori, a legendary samurai who inspired his host of loyal samurais for many years, leading a group of over 300 men, all of them formidable warriors in ancient Japan. Now, during one trip to Edo, which is now Tokyo, Asano butted heads with a particularly corrupt and generally unlikable protocol master, a man named Kira Yoshinaka, who was accustomed to making people bend over backwards for him, despite the cultural importance of of hospitality in Japan. You see, this kind of stuff just didn't fly with Asano, and after putting up with insult after insult, he finally drew his sword on Kira, wounding him in the process. Of course, in the capital though, this was very much a crime and one that was punishable by death. As a man of honour, Asano accepted his punishment and was ordered to commit seppuku as fit with his standing as a samurai. His clan of 300 men were disbanded, and Asano Naganori's estate was stripped of all holdings. But although the majority of his men would go off to wander the countryside masterless, a group of them couldn't accept this beseechment of honour. 47 of them, to be precise. The 47 Ronin. Masterless samurai who would go on to plot their revenge for over two years, relentlessly training day after day, seeking only one thing, justice for their wronged master and the death of Kira Yoshinaka. Well, on the 14th of December 1702, that is exactly what happened, and the 47 Ronin marched into Edo to Yoshinaka's mansion, who had assembled the city guard to defend him. The 47 Ronin fought like warrior poets, defeating Kira's force in the name of their fallen master, sustaining just two injuries in the process. One of them was a sprained ankle. Eventually, they found Kira, where they then cut off his head and carried it through the city of Edo to the grave of their master, Asano Naganori. Here the 47 Ronin place his head on Asano's grave, serving their final purpose, where they then turn themselves into the city. And then, moved by the impossible feat of loyalty displayed by the Ronin, the city allowed them to commit seppuku, restoring the honour of Asano Naganori and immortalising themselves forever in the legend of the 47 Ronin. Number 5. The Great Omar The Great Omar was a one-of-a-kind, 
tailor-made collection of Omar Khayyam's poetry. So if you're looking to score this at your local Barnes & Noble, you might have a bit of trouble. It was commissioned by the owner of a British bookshop, whose sole request was that it would be the greatest modern binding in the world. You know, nothing too lofty though. The book itself is made of 5,000 pieces of leather, 1,000 different gemstones, 100 square feet of gold, and some pages too, I guess. I think there's poetry inside there. The final book was priced for roughly $150,000 after finishing. So it's a pretty expensive book, but what makes it so cursed? Well, when the great Omar was purchased, it was bought by an American buyer and had to take a transatlantic trip on a little ship called the Titanic, a boat which as far as I know has never been involved in any sort of historical events of note whatsoever. The great Omar was never recovered from the wreckage and sank with the ship. Ten weeks after the book kissed the ocean floor, the man who bound it, Francis Sangorski, drowned while on vacation at the, only the age of 37. A little suspicious, isn't it? A bookbinder in the 1930s tried to recreate the great Omar, Stanley Bray. He finished the second iteration just in time for World War II to begin. The book was placed in a vault on London's 4th Street, which was one of the first sites to be bombed. I guess they heard about the book. The safe that held the book endured through the Blitz, but the safe's contents and the second Great Omar was incinerated and lost to the war. A third version has been crafted and is currently being held in a vault in the British Library, although given the book's history, I don't feel like I would be too comfortable spending any time around it if I didn't have to. Hey, liking what we do here at Top 5 Scary? Will we always love a little subscribe? Toss one our way. Number four, The Grand Grimoire. Another book you're probably gonna have some trouble finding on Amazon. The Grand Grimoire is a tome of black magic. No one can agree on when the Grimoire was originally birthed into this world, with people claiming that it could have been written anywhere from the 15th century to the 19th century. No one knows who even wrote the Grand Grimoire. Perhaps it merely appeared one day from another world tantalizing and asking to be read. Some urban legends claim that the book was written by a man possessed by the devil himself, acting as a vessel for his will to pen his musings. The book itself contains instructions for well, the, the, the book itself contains instructions for would-be warlocks to summon all manner of demons and sinister servants of the underworld, even including guides on how a fledgling necromancer could learn how to raise a spirit from the dead. Now, if all that sounds appealing to you, it's said that even so much as cracking the spine of the Grand Grimoire is enough to seal your soul to damnation, the literary equivalent of promising your soul to the underworld. The church, obviously, sought out to quell the rising threat of the Grand Grimoire's dark musings, and it is said that the original Grand Grimoire, gosh, that is fun to say, is currently being held sealed in the Vatican's legendary vault, where it shall never again be seen by prying eyes, or those wishing to uncover its many many dark secrets. There are alleged excerpts that have been reprinted and made available, but the full Grand Grimoire itself hasn't been seen by anyone in what would be centuries. Perhaps for good reason too, I mean, if the myths and legends around the book are to be believed. Number 3, The Crying Boy. I love a good haunted painting. Maybe it was just because I had an odd fondness for Ghostbusters 2 as a kid and a haunted painting centered pretty prominently in that. Maybe it's just because I'm enticed by the uncanny valley. I love a pair of eyes that you can look at but can never look at you back. Case in point. Take a look at this painting, The Crying Boy. Looks like a fairly innocuous painting, right? Wouldn't look too out of place in your dentist's office. It's not really my scene, but I'm sure a generation of grannies have loved to put this above the fireplace. It's also been the center of a series of strange coincidences that are just too odd to be true. It was painted by an Italian painter, one Giovanni Bergolin, and mass produced as a print across the 1950s, so everyone could enjoy hanging this sad crying boy in the comfort of their own home. Wow, that sentence out of context is crazy. Now, they would enjoy this painting in the comfort of their home until it would burn down because for some bizarre otherworldly reason firefighters around Essex London would report that frequently amidst smoldering ruins of a burned down house repeatedly they would find the crying boy print completely untouched by the flames even when everything else had burned to ash now once is bizarre two times that's pretty strange. But this happens three times, pick up the phone and call the Ghostbusters because you've got an outright paranormal mystery on your hands. The British tabloid The Sun loved the story and was spreading stories of the cursed paintings like a house on fire. Ooh, too soon? The Sun printed out warnings of people who owned the painting telling them that they should get rid of it lest they start to find themselves smelling smoke. The story was so popular and people were so invested in the curse of the crying boy that The Sun tried to take it upon themselves to rid London of the curse by holding a bonfire in which anyone who owned a print of the cursed painting could come 
torch it, and hopefully exercise whatever demons got into the printing press. The bonfire was a raging success, with sackfuls of the prints being torched, seemingly ending the curse of the crying boy. Does anyone else kind of want one of the prints though? I don't know, I just... I think there's something about it. I think it would tie the living room together. Number two, Ballista Balls. You know, the last couple years, I think, had all of us acting pretty strange. You know, maybe you got through it by binging all of Tiger King in a day. Maybe you got really into making a sourdough. Maybe you returned a cursed artifact you stole when you were a teenager. We all went through a strange period. In 2020, an anonymous source returned an ancient artifact that they'd stolen as a teenager to the Israeli government. A Bronze Age Ballista Ball fired during the Great Jewish Revolt by the Romans. The thief swiped them as a teenager when visiting with a group of friends, and had went on to live a fairly normal life. Had a nice career, found a partner, sired some children, but he had said that throughout his entire life he felt as if there was a weight over him, as if he had some invisible presence crushing down on him. He said no matter how long it had been or how much his life had moved past this one act of delinquency, his heart could never move from it. And he felt as if he had been cursed to forever bear its guilt. During the event of the last few years, he said it stirred in him this apocalyptic feeling that made him feel like he had to return the ballista balls in hopes of finally clearing his consciousness. I hope he didn't think he did all that. Through Facebook, he ended up getting put towards the right channels to return it. But you know what's kind of bizarre? This isn't even the first time that someone's returned a pair of cursed ballista balls, because in 2015, an almost identical story played out. In 2015, two ballista balls were returned to the Israeli authorities anonymously alongside a note saying, I took these in 1995 from a resident quarter at the foot of the summit. They have brought me nothing but trouble. Please do not steal antiquities. Well, I've got to say it's a nice change of pace to hear about people trying to undo the curse before things got too irrevocable. And a pretty simple, easy follow message for you kids at home. Don't steal antiquities. Unless you're Indiana Jones, that should be fairly easy for all of us to follow. And finally, number one, the Black Prince's Ruby. The Black Prince's Ruby was once thought to be the biggest ruby in the world. Unfortunately though, upon closer inspection, this mighty ruby turned out to be an imposter. A spinel disguised as a ruby, a mineral known as the Great Imposter. Perhaps then that it's fitting that this cursed gemstone's legacy began with a story of deceit. Prior to being the crowning jewel, in the imperial state crown of the UK, the Black Prince's ruby first appeared in the 14th century, where it was owned by Abu Said, who was the last sultan of Granada. Little history lesson for you, so don't fall asleep too much. In the late 13th century, Granada was losing a war to King Pedro the Cruel, who historically was not known to be nice. You know, given the title. The Christian kingdom of Castilla was taking more and more of Said's territory, and so to arrange a peaceful end to the war, the Sultan had requested an audience with King Pedro in Castilla and arranged a meeting. And they came to an agreement and the Sultan was welcomed. When the Sultan and his arriving party thought they were welcomed as guests, they were surprised to see King Pedro welcome the with drawn swords. He was King Pedro the Cruel, after all. I don't need to tell you what happened next, but King Pedro stripped the jewel off of the Sultan's corpse. Soon after, King Pedro found himself in a new war against his brother Henry of Trastamara for Castilla's throne. King Pedro commissioned the Black Prince Edward of England for aid, and as payment for his services, gave him the ruby, where it would get its name, the Black Prince's ruby. Edward would return home to England, but Pedro would fall in battle to his brother. Edward the Black Prince would die slowly and painfully from a disease before he could inherit the throne, giving the ruby to his son, Richard the second. Richard would become king, but he was taken out by Henry IV, who took the ruby as well, who then passed from a slow illness, giving the ruby to his son Henry V. This is the worst thing to re-gift possible. It would pass from a lineage of kings until eventually finding its way to the Tudors, and then eventually after that, finding a permanent home in the London Tower, amidst the crown jewel collection, where it's been sealed away, never to be claimed again. Because just look at the history of this thing. This is not something you ever want want to unwrap. Whew. Number five on this list is King Tut's mask. The curse of King Tut is one of the most famous curses to surround a tomb ever. King Tut was a pharaoh in ancient Egypt who boasted one of the most ornate tombs in history. This tomb carried a curse though, and those who entered it suffered fatal consequences. On the pyramids of Giza, there's a very specific curse written on the entrance. It reads, all people who enter this tomb who will make evil against this tomb and destroy it, may the crocodile be against them in the water and snakes against them on land. May the hippopotamus be against them in water, the scorpion on land. This curse stuck with those who entered. 
It all started with Howard Carter, the leader of the team, whose canary was eaten by a cobra the second that they first entered the tomb. Then the person who financed the whole excavation died shortly afterwards. And from there, a domino effect occurred where many others involved suffered horrible tragedies or passed away. Some speculate though that it wasn't actually the act of opening the tomb that sparked this curse, but it was what they did with King Tut's mask. King Tut had a burial mask on when he was mummified and put in his tomb. The mask is beautiful. It's meant to resemble the person it's on so that the gods can recognize him and bring him up to heaven. Inside the mask is a bunch of oils and materials that are said to help preserve the body. All of this is all well and good, but on the back of the mask is an inscription. This inscription is said to be a curse similar to the one on the pyramids of Giza. Well, if that wasn't enough, then there's a rumor this mask was broken during the excavation process and had to be reassembled when they took it back to their headquarters. Opening the tomb is already problematic, but to then break the mask of King Tut that has a curse inscribed on it, that's just asking for trouble. Number four on this list is King Casimir IV's coffin. King Casimir was born in 1427 into royalty. By 1440, when he would have only been 13, Casimir was named the Grand Duke of Lithuania and only seven years later in 1447 became the fully fledged King of Poland. He stood as the King of Poland right up until the day he died. Oftentimes, kings don't make it right up until their death, but King Casimir's success was pretty historic. He's known in Polish history as being one of the most politically active and prosperous kings to ever rule over their country. During his reign, he won several wars, recovered territories for Poland, and made their royal family one of the leaders in Europe. Due to all of the glory that he received in his life, it was only fitting that he have a tomb that reflected this. He died when he was 65 years old in 1492 and was put to rest in the chapel of Weywell Castle. There he lay for roughly 500 years until 1973 researchers opened the tomb to find a horrible surprise. The researchers opened this tomb and investigated the mummification process and all the artifacts he was buried with. They took his body and coffin out of this place and brought it back to their lab. What they didn't realize though was that this coffin had a curse to it. It's estimated that over 15 people died who worked on researching this body and this coffin. It took a while before they realized what was causing this death, but eventually they discovered the error of their ways. You see, the coffin was cursed, but it wasn't cursed with anything ghostly. It was cursed with Aspergillus flavus. Cursed is also a misleading word to use in this instance as well, because Aspergillus flavus is actually a pathogenic fungus. A fungus that when exposed to people, can become a killer. For a long time, people thought that there truly was an ancient curse surrounding this coffin, but it was actually this fungus that kept preying on people's immune systems. Eventually, King Casimir's body was taken and put back into his tomb, but not before the damage had been done and over 15 people had lost their lives. Number three, the Book of Abramelin. The Book of Abramelin, and I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong, I'm sure one of you ghouls and goblins will let me know, or the Book of the Sacred Magic of Abramelin the Mage, if you're not into that whole brevity thing, is an allegedly magic text that is thought to have been written at some point during the 14th century. It wasn't until the 19th century that it became recognized for its power, when the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn translated the book into English in the late 1890s. Now if you're unfamiliar with the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn and you're wondering which Final Fantasy that's from, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn was a secret society devoted to the study of the occult and spiritual development. From here, the book became a key text in occultism supposedly even inspiring Aleister Crowley's system of magic. So what's inside the book? Any pop-ups? The book centers around an incredibly elaborate ritual aimed at allowing a practicing sorcerer to communicate with their holy guardian angel. The book theorizing that everyone has their own personal guardian angel, a celestial other half from another world, if you will. After the sorcerer summons their guardian angel and enjoys a honeymoon phase, the book describes a uh, period of blissful intimacy. One needs to conquer every unredeemed spirit of the infernal regions, which sounds like a bit of a task. There's a lot of people, there's a lot of unredeemed spirit. Luckily, I, I think the angel helps out a bit. 
If the legends are true, then undoubtedly the information in this book isn't the kind of thing that should ever be falling into the wrong hands. I mean, that's just a general good piece of life advice. As a general rule of thumb, you shouldn't mess with demons unless you know what you're doing, okay? That's the kind of thing to leave up to professionals. For all of our sakes, you know? Number 2. The Voynich Manuscript The Voynich Manuscript is one of the more interesting books on this list. It's named after the first public owner of it. Wilfred Voynich. Unlike most of these cursed banned books, the Voynich manuscript is actually something you can seek out and read via Yale University's online collection. And you are more than welcome to peer over its pages, although you might find it a bit of a difficult text to read. Because the Voynich manuscript is written in a language that no human being speaks or has ever spoken. Carbon dating suggests the manuscript was first written at some unspecified time during the 14th century. And all 240 of the manuscript's pages are written completely unintelligibly. So if you want to take a look at this thing and try and help us crack this, please be my guest. Adorning its pages are confusing illustrations that only serve to further its mysterious reputation, with most of the drawings looking like a cross between a Hieronymus Bosch painting and a fever dream kaleidoscope nightmare. The book has made its way through countless owners, a succession of kings and other powerful leaders, and yet in all the years of its existence, no one has even come remotely close to understanding just what the Voynich manuscript is, where it came from, and what its purpose is. Is it cursed? Well, it's possible. Maybe it contains the instructions for all manner of demonic and occult magic and we just don't know how to read it yet. There are some people who believe that the Voynich manuscript could have been written by an extraterrestrial entity and gifted to us. And there's even some legends that claim the manuscript has some sort of apocalyptic curse hidden inside its mysterious scrawlings. We might never know. Unless you might be the one to crack it for us. Number one, Codex Gigas. Codex Gigas, Gigas, Gigas. One of you guys will tell me, I'm sure. Oft referred to as the Devil's Bible, is the biggest entry on this list, and not just for its renown. No, it, it's like literally the biggest entry on this list. It's three feet tall and weighs around 80 pounds. It wouldn't surprise me at all if the curse this book inflicts on you is a hernia. The Codex Gigas, which literally translates to giant book, is a medieval manuscript dating back to the 12th century. So what's the deal with the Codex Gigas? Well, legends tell the Codex was penned by a monk who had broken his vows. And to repent for his sins, he was sentenced to be walled up alive. He promised, as an apology, that he would write a powerful book to glorify the monastery. And his book would contain all known human knowledge at that point. Everything. The original Wikipedia, and he wasn't even asking for donations. The legend continues that the monk, realizing that this task was a bit lofty, even for the quickest of scribes, reached out for some help co-authoring his mighty manuscript. He reached out and prayed, but not from God but instead from Lucifer, asking for help finishing the book in exchange for his eternal soul. I'm uh, starting to understand why he was sentenced for breaking his vows. Not really the best plan if you're looking to redeem yourself in the eyes of the church by making a deal with the devil, but hey, we've all done pretty crazy things trying to make a deadline. I totally get it. It's said that Lucifer himself helped complete the book, and the monk drew a portrait of the devil himself as thanks. That's where the book gets its name, The Devil's Bible. The book is replete with occultism, dark rituals, and imagery. I mean, after all, it's said to contain the entirety of the knowledge of the human race up to this point. So who's to speak what sort of sinister secrets are kept between its giant pages? There were estimates and tests to try and recreate the manuscript, suggesting that even one man writing, without illustrations, would have taken the better part of two decades to write the calligraphy present inside that book. So did this monk have some otherworldly help? Maybe just a huge stack of Red Bull? And what is inside this book? If your Latin's any good, the manuscript is kept on display in the National Library of Stockholm. Just be careful what you read. You've got no idea what you could bring into this world. Number five, the family jewels. Some things get passed on generation to generation. Some are begged, some are borrowed, and some are stolen. Our first cursed item has made its way across the many seas at the price of many lives. At a whopping 186 carats, the Koh-i-Noor diamond may look precious beyond all belief, but this cursed gemstone has a much darker, unbelievable side too. The name derives from the Persian Hindi word mountain of light. Many theories exist as to its original owner and who was originally cut for. A Hindu description of the diamond warns that quote, he who owns this diamond will own the world, but will also know all of its misfortunes. Only God or women can wear it with impunity. Well, that's jarring to say the least. Right there in writing, huh? Yeah. It passed between the hands of various rulers, blood-soaked era after another, 
a king who blinded his own son and a ruler whose head had become encrusted with liquid molten gold was paid for this price. Legend has it that the stone's origins of causing death and misfortune to any male who owns or wears it stems from brothers murdering each other to even sons murdering their fathers over it. But does it actually carry a curse affecting men who wear it? First owned by the emperors of the Mughal Empire in India, it was taken and added with the Timur ruby to make an armband for ruler of the Peacock Empire. The diamond then went to Sikh Maharaja Ranjit Singh. After his death, his five-year-old son Duleep Singh, the last Maharaja of the Sikh Empire, would be the last male who ever seemed to wear it. Since being owned by the British royal family, and oddly enough, it's only ever been worn by females. Huh. After Queen Victoria's death, Queen Alexandra got it and was used to crown her at her coronation in 1902. The diamond was then transferred to Queen Mary's crown in 1911 and finally to the Queen Mother's crown in 1937, where it remained for more than 80 years. When Queen Elizabeth died in 2002, the crown was placed on top of her casket for the funeral. All of the crowns are now on display in the Jewel House at the Tower of London, with crystal replicas of the diamonds set in the older models they were in. So what's the deal? Is this thing still cursed? Did the royal family know something that we didn't? Maybe. Number four, the statues of Lem. The women of Lem statue was discovered in Lem, Cyprus in 1878 and dates back to about 3500 BCE. The statue eventually earned the nickname the Goddess of Death after four different families experienced tragedy while handling and owning the carved stones. The first owner, Lord Elfont, along with his entire family, perished within six years of owning the statue, all from mysterious and rapid illnesses. The other two owners, Ivor Minucci and Lord Thompson Noel, also died along with their entire families just a few short years after obtaining the statue within their homes. The fourth owner, Sir Alan Biverbrook, died alongside his wife and two daughters of mysterious causes while in possession of the carved rock. Although his sons did not believe in the curse attached to the statue, out of fear of the sudden misfortunes around them, they decided to gift the Royal Scottish Museum in Edinburgh the find, where it is now encased in glass, safe, unable to bear any other family bad news. You gotta think, someone was just like sitting there back then chiseling this rock like 6,000 years ago. What were they thinking? What were they saying out loud? What were they looking at? Why did they seem to have blessed this rock with so much evil and misfortune? You tell me. Number three on this list is the Screaming Skull of Burton Agnes Hall. The Screaming Skull of Burton Agnes Hall wasn't necessarily from a tomb, but it was recovered from a grave, so I think it still counts in this criteria. Burton Agnes Hall was built in the 17th century in Yorkshire. It was built by Sir Henry Griffith, who had three daughters he loved very much. They all moved there and were very happy for a time. One of the daughters was named Anne, and Anne loved to explore the outdoors. One day though, when she was exploring, a gang of robbers got to her and they beat her and left her for dead. When the family found her, there was barely any life left in her. They brought her back to their home, but her time on this world wasn't long. While she was dying, she had a very strange request to her two remaining sisters. She begged them to take her head and put it within the walls of the hall so that she could always be there with her family. She was dying, so they agreed, but neither of them actually intended on taking their sister's head off and keeping it in their home. A few days later, she died, and they buried her outside the hall without keeping their promise. This was a big mistake though. After she was buried, strange noises and banging sounds started happening all over the hall. Screams and crying could be heard throughout, and moans the family couldn't ignore. Eventually they gave in, dug Anne up, and took off her head. They brought it into the hall and the disturbances, they stopped. But years passed and the ownership of this hall changed. The new owners, they had no interest in a dead girl's skull in their home and got rid of it, but sure enough, just when they did, the noises and the hauntings started again. Over the centuries, people have tried and tried again to rid themselves of this skull many times, but eventually, they always cave and they have to bring it back in. The skull truly is cursed and it must remain inside the home at all times if you ever want any peace from Anne's spirit. Number two on this list is King Tut's statuettes. King Tut's tomb didn't just have one cursed item, it had multiple. His burial mask is pretty widely known, but many don't know the story of two statuettes that also came from this tomb. These were two small bronze statues found inside the tomb. One of them with their hand over their heart, and the other one with their hand over their mouth. Lord Carnivon, the man who funded the initial excavation, gave these to a friend as a gift. This was meant to be in good faith and a friendly gesture, 
but he had no idea the trouble that they would cause. The name of the family is omitted in this story to protect their integrity and the person who received the statues is simply referred to as James. James received these statues and brought them back to America with him but then started to suffer the consequences. Once wildly successful, James started to lose everything. His company, his money, his family. James went through three failed marriages, a complete collapse of his immense fortune, and finally died of illness without ever realizing these statues were part of the problem. He left them to his grandson in his will and the curse continued. When his grandson took hold of these statues, he was a decorated Olympian, but he also suffered a serious fall from grace. Injuries, other accidents, and failed business ventures plagued the grandson from the second that he took hold of these statues until finally he called the museum. He donated them to the museum so that they could be put with some of the other King Tut pieces and the curse could finally be lifted from his family. Now it's certainly possible that this was all a coincidence and this family just got down on their luck at the wrong time. But anything involving King Tut has the potential to be cursed and I wouldn't be surprised if these statues were part of that. Number one on this list is the Unlucky Mummy. The Unlucky Mummy is an ornate wooden coffin that was found in an ancient Egyptian tomb. This coffin's preservation was remarkable for how old experts thought that it must be. The coffin was said to hold the remains of ancient Egyptian princess Amun-Ra. The legend says that in 1890 some British men stumbled upon this casket at an Egyptian excavation site. There were four men and they all suffered greatly right after coming in contact with this coffin. The first man, who initially took ownership of the coffin, was seen leaving his hotel and walking straight into the desert to never be seen again only after one day of possessing said casket. The second man on the very next day was accidentally shot and had to have his arm amputated. The third man, when they did eventually get back to Britain, returned to see that all of his life savings were gone. And the last man died from disease shortly after the discovery of this artifact. And just like that, the curse of the unlucky mummy began. Now there are some misconceptions with this mummy. Some people believe that the unlucky mummy got put onto the Titanic ship and that's what caused the Titanic to sink. That was never the case though. In fact, once the coffin got to Britain, it's never left. That doesn't mean that this thing isn't still cursed though. It currently resides at the British Museum in London. Since its arrival there, other rumors about this ancient artifact have come out, such as the untimely death of writer Bertram Fletcher Robinson. He was convinced that there was no curse surrounding this coffin. In fact, he even wrote extensively on that topic, but then he died shortly afterwards. Incidents like this have happened all throughout history, further solidifying the curse around this coffin. With everything that's happened to it, the term unlucky might just be a bit of an understatement. Number five on this list is the Die Book Box. This is an evil box that tormented many people and even claimed some lives along the way. Zach Baggins writes, According to Jewish folklore, a diabok is a dark spirit that takes over the bodies of living people and uses them for evil. Legend has it that a diabok can be trapped inside of a box and prevented from causing mischief unless the box is opened, that is. Several years ago, the diabok box came up for sale on eBay. The seller listed a vintage wine cabinet that came from the estate of a woman who survived a World War or two concentration camp. The seller, an antique dealer named Kevin Manis, claimed that the first owner's granddaughter was terrified of the box, warning him that her grandmother said it held a diabook. After buying the cabinet, he was plagued by a series of unfortunate events and recurring nightmares of an old hag that would brutally attack him, causing him to wake up with bruises on his body. He also experienced an overpowering stench of cat urine in his home. Tragically, his mother suffered a stroke while opening the box. Not surprisingly, he decided to get rid of it. The box eventually ended up in the hands of Missouri Medical Museum director Jason Haxton, who was skeptical about the powers attributed to the box. He soon changed his mind. After acquiring the box, he began to experience a series of medical maladies, including bleeding eyes and strange rashes. He also began to dream of being attacked by an old hag and would also awake with bruises on his body. 
Kevin Manis told me that while the box was in Haxton's basement, a man died there and his body was found lying next to the box. He eventually became so unnerved by the box that he reached out to scientists and rabbis who instructed him to build a wooden ark lined with 24 karat gold, place the box inside, and bury it in the ground. Now this actually wasn't the end of the story for this box. The box was eventually dug up again and then later donated to a museum. This was after it had tormented a few more people, mind you, though. Now, it's fully encased in a glass covering, but even that doesn't stop the evil spirit from coming after people. Many people who have visited this box have reported having serious episodes in the room while they're looking at it. Whatever spirit is trapped inside this box, it is clearly an extremely powerful one. The box remains on display at the museum, but I wouldn't recommend going to check it out if I was you. Number four on this list is the Devil's Rocking Chair. The Devil's Rocking Chair is actually from one of Ed and Lorraine Warren's most famous case, The Devil Made Me Do It. Zach Baggins writes, The horror began in July 1980 when David Glatzel, 11 years old, became possessed by a demon. One night he woke up screaming, claiming that he had been visited by a man with big black eyes, a thin face with animal features, jagged teeth, pointed ears, horns, and hooves. David was, everyone agreed, not the kind of kid who liked scary movies or who was likely to make things up, and he was visibly shaken up by this experience. He became rather withdrawn and quiet. His older sister, Debbie, asked her fiancé, Orrin Johnson, if he would stay with her family for a while and see whether it would help David get out of his depression. Orrin, of course, agreed, but things didn't get better. David reported having more nightmares about the terrifying man who promised to take his soul. Odd scratches and bruises began to appear on the boy, and all the injuries seemed to happened while he was asleep. Odd sounds, which Arn couldn't explain, were heard in the attic. Worst of all, David began to claim that he was now seeing the beast while he was awake. He was always seen sitting in the family's rocking chair, which the beast now claimed as his own. David was the only one who saw the beast in the chair, but family members often saw it rocking back and forth, seemingly under its own power. This was obviously a lot, so the Warrens were brought in to perform the exorcism. The exorcism took place in that rocking chair and it's thought that the chair itself still has some evil energy from this spirit attached to it. Now the chair resides at the haunted museum but owner Zach Beggins actually took the exhibit down because the chair was simply too dangerous he thought. Number three, the mummy. Not actually a mummy but the mummy board or coffin or lid. The board is painted of an unknown high status woman from the 21st or 22nd dynasty. Time scale for you that's about a thousand years BCE. The British British Museum's unlucky mummy has earned quite the reputation for causing destruction through its ancient curse. The mummy was found at Thebes in Greece in the late 1800s, and tales of its curse started soon after its discovery. It's said that of the four young Englishmen who bought it, two died in a shooting accident and two died of health problems. A string of illnesses, accidents, and deaths following this are said to be attributed to the lid. One of the most infamous rumors about the mummy's curse is that it caused the sinking of the Titanic. Wait a minute, what? One of the victims on board was a journalist who apparently was the first to publish articles about the mummy's find and the curse that went with it. Survivors from the disaster recall hearing stories about the ship of an ominous artifact that has a sinister reputation. As the mummy's stories and the rumors spread, people who survived began to ask the question if the rumors had caused the disaster that night. The unlucky mummy is now an ancient Egyptian artifact in the collection of the British Museum in London. The identity of the original owner is still being studied and the related causes brought on by it. Due to the brief hieroglyphic inscriptions of short religious phrases, scientists Scientists are still trying to decipher the name and the curse that comes along with it, and the actual location of where the body disappeared to. It's been feared since the discovery in the late 1880s, and the mummy's lid has acquired a reputation credited with causing death, injury, and large-scale disasters, earning the nickname the unlucky mummy. None of these stories have any basis in fact, of course, but the mummy serves as a spiritual question mark and remains a mystery to scientists who crack the code open. Yo, where's Brendan Fraser when you need him, right? He can figure this whole thing out. Number two, the haunted bed. Apparently there's a bed that makes you more dizzy and have more sinister evil visions than that of a night on a waterbed. Yeah, I've had a couple hungover nights lost at sea, let me tell ya. Gets pretty choppy out there. Highly don't recommend it. But this bed, I also highly don't recommend. The lavishly ornate Great Bed of Ware does not like you sleeping in it. The hardwood oak bed is richly decorated and carved with figures and scenes you could daydream for, well, days over. It's so large that it's rumored to comfortably sleep four couples. Yeah. 
talk about a California king. There is a tale that suggests that the bed was made in the 15th century for King Edward IV by a very gifted carpenter, but through the years found itself being passed between the inns of wear where commoners were able to sleep in it, break the legs, and apparently cover it head to toe in graffiti. Yeah, the disrespect alone. The defacing got so bad that apparently the ghost of the maker haunts those who are not of royal blood. Basically not blessed by God to rule. It's so old and so haunted that apparently people who spend the night are woken up violently by specters watching them sleep. Apparently there are so many initials carved into the wood, images drawn on it, that it's hard to know who actually the bed was originally fitted for, and who actually cursed it. Some researchers believe that the curse surrounding the bed could have actually been carved into it with symbols and text that hexed the next user. Whatever its history, it's haunted haunted. The bed can now be found in the British galleries of the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. We need like the Long Island medium to take a nap in it, you know what I mean? See what she thinks. And coming in at the number one spot, the Terracotta Army. The Terracotta Army was discovered in 1974 by a group of farmers. Yang Zifa, his five brothers and neighbor were digging a well east of the Quin Emperor's tomb mound at Mount Lee. For centuries, occasional reports mentioned pieces of terracotta figures and fragments of the Quin necropolis. Roofing tiles, bricks, and masonry were regularly found. But when they discovered heads, Chinese archeologists started to investigate. To this day, it remains the largest pottery figure group ever found. The Terracotta Army seemed to be a collection of terracotta sculptures depicting the armies of Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor of China. It is a form of funerary art buried with the emperor around 209 BCE with the purpose of protecting the emperor in the afterlife. The figures were discovered in Lingtong County outside Shaanxi, China. The figures vary in height according to their rules and they're all dressed in different garbs, the tallest of course being the generals. These statues include warriors, chariots equipped with horses, more than 8,000 soldiers, 130 chariots, 520 horses, and 150 cavalry. Other terracotta non-military figures were found in pits close by, including officials, acrobats, strongmen, and musicians. Yo, are we sure that Medusa didn't just like make her way through China and start stoning people in time with her looks? Because that's like an entire city made out of clay. In the records of the Grand Historian, China's 24 dynastic histories, it was written that work on the mausoleum began in 246 BCE, soon after Emperor Quinn ascended the throne. Apparently the project involved 700,000 workers. Yeah, I'd really hope so, because that many perfectly sculpted figures are so realistic, there must have been a city of artists. The site is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site and has been since 1987. This is scary just looking at it. I'm not convinced this was just an art project for the journey between spirit realms. I think this was used as a decoy for battle. 20,000 figurines just chilling, waiting? Seems pretty intimidating to me. Whatever its origins, it's jarring to look at. What do you think? Number five on this list is the Hope Diamond. The Hope Diamond is one of the most famous jewels in the history of the world. Its exceptional size and beauty are practically unparalleled. It is 45.52 carats and gives off a beautiful blue hue when it is hit by the light, truly a marvel from the world. This diamond is said to be worth anywhere from 200 to 350 million American dollars. To put that in perspective, if you had this diamond, you could buy your own Hawaiian private island in exchange for it. The earliest records of the diamond go all the way back to 1666 when a French gem merchant purchased it. Since then, it has changed hands many times, ending up in the hands of some royalty and eventually making its way to the National Museum of Natural History in Washington DC where it resides today. This diamond may be the most beautiful stone on the entire planet, but one should be careful with it because it's said to hold a curse. Over the years that this diamond has been in circulation, many tragedies have befallen fallen the owners of this stone. An article written by Christy Puchko writes, Some believe it is cursed, with a whole mythology claiming that great misfortune and misery will befall any who dares to wear the 45.52 carat diamond. Rumored victims of the diamond have suffered disgrace, divorce, suicide, imprisonment, torture, financial ruin, lynching, or decapitation. One was even said to have been ripped apart by dogs and another by a French mob. If these stories are true, then it's no wonder why the legend of a curse has circulated around this diamond. So with all that being said, I want to ask you guys. If somebody offered you this diamond, do you take the risk? On one hand, you could be the owner and the bearer of potentially the most sought after rock on the planet, but on the other hand, you might just be a very expensive dog treat. Let me know what you got down below, diamond or no diamond. 
Number four on this list is Tut's tomb. Now this tomb is the most famous, however this entry could be generalized to any tomb of a pharaoh that is disturbed. If a pharaoh's tomb is disturbed, then you will have activated the pharaoh's curse, and this will befall anyone who enters and disturbs the sleep of these mummified Egyptian royalty. For a long time, hieroglyphs couldn't be deciphered, but in the early 19th century this changed and we were able to read them. On the pyramids of Giza, there is a very specific curse written on the entrance. It reads, all people who enter this tomb who will make evil against this tomb and destroy it, may the crocodile be against them in the water and the snakes against them on land. May the hippopotamus be against them in the water and the scorpion on land. This acts as a pretty clear cut warning to stay away and not disturb anyone that's inside. I should also note that this rule applies to anyone. We're talking archaeologists, thieves, literally anyone who enters. Your motives for entering don't matter, it's only that you are there. Over the years, this curse has reared its ugly head time and time again. When they first opened the tomb of King Tut, there is a famous story of how Howard Carter, the leader of the team operating the excavation, had a canary and when it entered the tomb, died at the hands of a cobra. Two weeks later, the person who financed the whole operation, Lord Carnivon, was bit by a mosquito and died due to a horrible infection. These are two of the most famous examples, but for centuries, bad luck, sudden illness, and death have been tied to these ancient tombs. Another one of the pharaoh's tombs warns, They that shall break the seal of this tomb shall meet death by a disease that no doctor can diagnose. I'd say that that's just about as clear cut as curses come these days. Number three on this list is the Hope Diamond. Don't get me wrong guys, I would love to have this thing, but I just don't know if the juice is worth the squeeze here. Google Arts and Culture says, one of the most famous diamonds in the world, the Hope Diamond, originated in the Kular mine in Andhra Pradesh, India. According to legend, the stone is cursed and brings misfortune to anyone who owns it. The curse is said to have come about when the original diamond was stolen from the eye of a statue. The thief met a grisly end, kick-starting a pattern of misfortune for all those who possessed the diamond. Over the years, owners of the Hope Diamond have befallen fates including death by murder, execution, they've taken their own lives, bankruptcy, and imprisonment. Thankfully, the curse seems to have been lifted when the diamond was donated to the Smithsonian in 1958. Now, I don't really buy into the fact that this curse is lifted, in my opinion. Like, literally, if you own this diamond, then you die or someone you love dies. That's what's happened throughout history. In the best possible case scenario, you just get hit with like horrible luck and lose all your money or some other horrible thing. There just really isn't any good way to spin this. Owning the Hope Diamond is pretty much a horrible idea. Number two on this list is the Unlucky Mummy. Do not get on a boat if said boat is also carrying this mummy. Google Arts and Culture says the Unlucky Mummy isn't actually a mummy, but the mummy bore or coffin lid of a high status woman who lived in around 950 to 900 BCE. Discovered in Thebes in the 1800s, the four young Englishmen who first purchased the mummy all died in unfortunate circumstances. Rumors of the curse soon spread and in the early 20th century, journalist William Thomas Steed wrote an article on the jinxed artifact. Steed went on to be one of the passengers on the doomed Titanic. It's said that he told stories of the curse in the run up to the disaster, with many believing that the mummy itself caused the ship's watery end. Today, the unlucky mummy is on display in the British Museum. The Titanic was supposed to be unsinkable. Enter in the unlucky mummy and boom, now the unsinkable ship goes down. Maybe it's a stretch to say that this thing caused the literal Titanic crash, but I can at least guarantee that it probably didn't help. At least this thing is now locked up in a museum very much on land and not connected to any boats that I know of. And number one on this list, is the Hands Resist Him painting. I'm all about having some cool, groundbreaking art, but this painting definitely crosses the line. The lineup says, there is no doubt the painting is disturbing. It shows a young boy standing next to a girl doll with hollow eyes and a sad, downturned mouth. The doll is holding a strange device with wires coming out of it. The eeriest part of the painting are the many disembodied children's hands reaching toward the boy through the glass panels of a door just behind him. But 
But even more disturbing than the painting itself are the stories of what has happened to people who come in contact with it. A few years after the painting was sold, the art critic Henry Seldes died. Then the gallery owner died. Then in 1984, John Marley died. The painting disappeared, not surfacing again until 2000 in a bizarre posting on eBay. The new owners were trying to sell it because, they said, it was haunted. They claimed the boy and the doll in the picture would fight with each other during the night, terrifying their four-year-old daughter. They set up a motion sensing camera in the room for three nights and claimed they had captured the boy in the picture, leaving the frame and coming into the room, apparently fleeing in terror. The literal kid in the painting is leaving. Not freaking cool, guys. My paintings are supposed to be static and not moving, and they definitely aren't supposed to be walking around my home scaring the living bejesus out of me and my family. Apparently, this painting is locked up in a storage locker now, and no one is allowed to see it. Number five, the Sword of Dane Slef. The Sword of Dane Slef, and hey, there's a good chance I'm pronouncing that wrong, so let me know, is among the most famous of weapons in Nordic myths, a legendary cursed sword of yore. Dane Slef was the blade of King Hogni, who was a noble king in ancient Viking stories. The Dane Slef sword was handcrafted by the dwarf Dane, who is said to be among the most skilled craftsmen in all of the realms. The the name of the sword literally translates to Dane's legacy. However, the sword had been imbued with a dark, powerful magic energy. Whenever the mighty Dane Slif was drawn, it could not be sheathed until blood had coated its blade. Someone had to die to feed the thirst of blood that quelled inside the tempered steel. Not just that too, but this cursed sword must have had like a very specific hunger pang for neck blood, as the sword had to behead an enemy. Sounds like an extremely high maintenance cursed sword. Surely all blood tastes the same, right? To a sword? I don't know, maybe I'm being dismissive. The sword features prominently in the story of Prose Edda, an ancient Nordic textbook thought to date back from the 12th century, which told the story of King Hogni and his beautiful daughter Hild, while he warred in the eternal battle of the kings. According to this old story, Hogni came to meet other kings across the land, and brought his daughter to introduce them. However, a jealous rival king seized his daughter and stole her away. Hogni gathered as many of his most fearsome warriors as he could to reclaim her, and sailed west in pursuit of his daughter. He found her on an island, yet her captor had attempted to persuade Hogni into making peace with him. But Hogni told him it was too late to end that, I mean, makes sense, you stole my daughter bro. But the Dainsleth had been drawn, and it couldn't be sheathed until he had been beheaded. The legend then goes on to state that the two men fought for 143 years. But I'm hoping they took like two 15 minute breaks a day at least. And my ghouls and goblins, if you love the scares we put out for you, the nicest way to show thanks is to toss a little like and subscribe our way. If you're already subscribed, you're the coolest. If you're not, well I still like you lots, but you could really win me over with a like and subscribe. Just saying, if you wanted to get on my good side. Number 4. Runes of Power To the Vikings, runes and runic magic were a cornerstone of their culture. Runes were their language, after all, their written language. The old poem Havamal explains that Odin, the Allfather, discovered the runes when he hung himself from the world tree, Yggdrasil, in order to attain enlightenment. As he hung on the tree, blowing for 9 nights and 9 days, he found himself slowly fading away, ready to be taken away to hell, when as he was about to die, he found the runes, took them, and earned his life, and bestowed them to humanity. Carving a rune into an object imbued it with a great deal of power. With the right inscriptions and the aid of a powerful seeress or sorceress, you could predict the future, protect yourself, or your family from misfortune. You could even imbue a blade with powerful energy. Skyrim got that right exactly. As well, runes were said to be the key to activating conjurations, curses, and spells. But as well, runic inspirations were found to bless just everyday things. Oftentimes, they told stories within them too. Rune stones were also used in Viking culture as landmarks, and the inscriptions they bore contained powerful magic within them. Take the Glavendrup stone, which contains a powerful warning to anyone who dares to move it. Listen to what it says. Ragnhildr placed this stone in memory of Ali the Pale, priest of the sanctuary, honorable thane of the retinue. Ali's sons made the monument in memory of their father, and his wife in memory of her husband, and Soti carved these runes in memory of his lord. Thor, hallow these runes. 
a warlock be he who damages this stone, drags it in memory of another. So this rune stone's got a little curse put in place to make sure no one disturbs the slumber of Ali the Pale. Perhaps one of the most famous rune stones in the world is the Björktop rune stone in Sweden. A mysterious rune stone whose purpose is not fully known, but bears another frightening inscription. Listen to this one, and I, I gotta put a bit of a voice on for this one, you'll understand. <clears throat> I, master of the runes, conceal here runes of power. Incessantly plagued by maleficence, doomed to insidious death is he who breaks this monument. Do forgive me, but can you imagine me just reading that normal? Would not have worked. So we might not know what the Bjorktope runestone is for, but we can say with certainty no one is willing to move it to find out what might be built on top of it, just in case runic magic is real and they don't want to experiment with dooming themselves to an insidious death plagued by malfeasance. That sounds terrible. Number three on this list is James Dean's Little Bastard. Now I'm certainly stretching the definition of ancient history on this one because this story actually takes place in the 50s, but with the amount of lore that surrounds it, I wanted to include it in this video. James Dean was an extremely successful male actor in the 50s and was one of the biggest heartthrobs of the generation. He's critically acclaimed and is potentially one of the best actors to ever play the cool bad boy roles. Sadly, he was taken far too soon and died in a car accident at the age of 24. The car accident took place in a rural town in California. The accident was a head-on collision that he had in his sports car. This sports car was a silver Porsche 550 Spider, and James Dean affectionately referred to it as his little bastard. This car, although a super cool vehicle, is completely cursed. After Dean died, George Barris, a hot rod designer, purchased what was left of the car with the intention to sell it for parts. When this car was being worked on, it fell and completely crushed the leg of one of the mechanics who was working on it. This is when the potential of a curse started to materialize, but it would grow into so much more. The parts started to get sold and people started to notice a very horrible connection. Anyone who bought parts of this car started to die. The buyer of the engine of the little bastard died shortly after in a fatal car crash. Somebody who bought the tires got in a horrible accident when those same tires just blew out whilst they were on the road. The person who bought the transmission was sent to hospital with critical injuries after getting in a car crash. The truck driver who was moving the car's frame, he got in a horrible accident and he was killed. The amount of death and tragedy that ensued from this car is truly uncanny. The frame of the car that the truck driver was transporting was eventually stolen and to this day, we don't know where it is. I hope whoever stole it though at least had the foresight not to ever drive with it because the consequences could be dire. Number two on this list is the Bassano Vase. The Bassano Vase is a pretty vase that was made all the way back in the 1500s in Napoli, Italy. The vase isn't ornate in nature. It has a very simplistic silver design. It was initially intended as a wedding present. However, it may just have been the worst wedding present that anyone has ever gifted. That's because this vase is a vase of death. Now I know that that sounds dramatic, but it truly brings death to whomever comes in contact with it. Its initial run-in with death is when it was given as a wedding gift and that same night as it was gifted, the bride was murdered in her home while she was holding that vase. Some people believe that her spirit haunts this vase now or that a spirit of death has always had its clutches on this vase. Either way, it didn't stop with just the bride. At the time, the family didn't realize that the vase had anything to do with the misfortune that had befallen the bride and they continued to pass the vase down generation to generation. However, it seemed that whomever was in possession of this vase would meet an untimely death soon after receiving it. After the family realized what was going on, they boxed the vase up and put a note in it that read, Beware, this vase brings death. The vase was auctioned off in 1998 though and the note wasn't included. It sold for $2,250 and it was the worst purchase the buyer ever made. Three months after buying it, they died. Then three more deaths of the following owners were linked to this phase until finally the original family who auctioned it off in the first place demanded that the police take it away. Since then, no one has heard anything from it, which is probably the best thing for everyone. Number one on this list is the Crying Boy Painting. Once again, stretching the term ancient here a little bit, but it ties into World War II, so I feel like it should be counted. Giovanni Bragolini was a Spanish artist who was famously credited with making a series of paintings of crying children. He made these in the early 1950s and they were meant to symbolize all of the poor children who became orphans due to the brutal fighting in World War II. His initial market was tourists, however these paintings, they started to really take off in Europe and a lot of British families 
families grew fond of them. For years, they were nothing more than just a painting until in 1985 when the curse of the crying boy hit the mainstream. Ron and Mary lost their home from a kitchen fire. Even though their entire livelihood burned to the ground, the painting of the crying boy that they had, it lived on. It was the one item to survive from the fire. Ron's brother Peter was a fireman and he said that this wasn't the first time that he saw this. In fact, he believed that he had witnessed the same phenomenon 50 times before. It was then believed that not only were these paintings immune to fire, but the owning of them would inevitably cause a fire in the first place. Mass hysteria ensued and legends started to come out of everywhere in regards to these paintings. People claimed that it caused their family members to die or that it was cursed with the soul of the children it depicted. Either way, this reached unparalleled levels and finally a newspaper, The Sun, said that if people were to ship them their copies of these paintings, they would dispose of them. Over 2,500 copies were sent to this newspaper and they burned all of them in a massive fire. I don't know if it really was the paintings causing these fires or if they were cursed, but chalking it up to a coincidence seems a little bit too good to be true to me. Number five, the Great Bed of Ware. Located in the Victoria and Albert Museum, the Great Bed of Ware has become infamous for its dark, twisted history. Constructed in 1850, the bed was created as a tourist attraction for an inn in Ware. The four-poster bed is over three meters wide and is the only known example of a bed this size. It's been said that it is able to accommodate at least four couples, minimum. Eight people, wow. <laughs> Guests would carve their initials into the wood Wood, or apply red wax seals to commemorate their stay and leave their mark on the bed. The marks are still visible on the bed to this day. The bed's carving is typical for the late Elizabethan period with ornamental ribbon-like patterns, lions and satyrs to symbolize fertility and virility. By 1931, the bed became the single most expensive item of furniture, specifically a single piece of furniture opposed to a set. According to legend, the carpenter who made the bed was so enraged by the disrespectful treatment of his work that his ghost attacked any commoner who slept in it. And you know, the carpenter made the bed for a king and then traveling commoners slept in it and carved their names all over. I'd be kind of upset too. Like, he must have believed the bed was going to be treated a lot differently than it actually was. The bed he had made for a king was instead damaged and covered in graffiti. The bed is now on display in Britain, and you are able to visit it. But luckily for both you and the carpenter's ghost, no one is able to sleep in the bed now. Number four, the Terracotta Army. The Terracotta Army is a collection of terracotta sculptures that depict the armies of Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor of China. You know, the one that searched for immortality and ate mercury in an attempt to live forever. Yeah, that one. The statues are a form of art that were buried along with Kinshi, with the purpose of protecting him in his afterlife. The statues were first discovered in 1974 by a group of local farmers. The figures varied in height according to their rank, the tallest being the generals. The figures included warriors, chariots, and horses. There were three pits which held over 8,000 soldiers, 130 chariots with 520 horses, and 150 cavalry horses. Most were found in the mausoleum for Qin Shi, but there were also some found in nearby pits that weren't directly in his massive underground grave. The village that the farmers were from believed that if they disturbed the army, they would receive misfortune and bouts of bad luck. Their suspicions were sadly correct, seeing as their 2,000 year old village was destroyed in order to create an enormous museum over the area. I mean, I'd say that's less misfortune and more human idiocy. Just leave well enough alone. You don't need to make everything a spectacle. The extravagant funeral art is available for observation in the museum, and pieces of the army have been sent all over the world. But you should definitely think twice before deciding to visit the exhibit. Bad luck and misfortune are definitely able to spread to curious onlookers. Guys, I know I usually tell you to stay curious, but if you come across someone's funeral art, don't be curious. Turn around and pretend like you never saw it. It's like if you decided to unearth someone's coffin just because you thought it was cool. It's weird. That would be a weird 
disrespectful thing to do. Number three, the Nidaros Cathedral. The Nidaros Cathedral is a popular tourist hotspot in Norway. Renowned for its beautiful architecture, it's a stunning monument to Norway's very rich history. And it's also quite known as one of the more haunted buildings in the entire country. It's located in the city center of Trondheim, named after the Trondheim Nidaros, which was the capital of Norway during the era of Vikings. In the early days, it was a humble, simple wooden chapel built to serve as the tomb of St. Olaf, a Viking king who helped introduce Christianity to Viking culture and would be remembered as the patron saint of Norway. It was the traditional location for the consecration of new kings of Norway. Now if you're looking at this and you think, wow, what a building. That's because it took 230 years to build it, so I would hope it looks great. From the years 1070 to 1300, it was worked on round the clock. Now let's get into the most important part, and the only part we even care about this building is the ghost. I just spent so much time talking about architectural history when we could be talking about a ghost. Norway's most famous ghost is known as the monk, and he's an apparition that manifests as a medieval monk with a bloody gash along its throat, dripping onto the floor. The monk's first sighting was in 1924, and since then has become a bit of a staple of the cathedral, with countless sightings and tourists reporting hearing, seeing, or feeling the monk around the cathedral. The first sighting was from a bishop's wife during service, and she claims that she saw the monk standing behind the congregation with bright glowing blue eyes. She said his face was sharp and glowing, and when he raised his hand, that blood started to pour from his throat. The priest who was tending to the service at the time claims that while he was speaking, he felt an unspeakable pain in his throat, as if something was lodged in it. Ugh. Number two, Viking graves. Now the Vikings were a very superstitious people. Ghosts were a very common belief and possible threat in medieval Norway. Your soul could go just about all over. You might end up in Valhall, the realm of Odin, where you can drink and fight to your heart's content for eternity, or you could end up in Folkvang. Freya's realm, a lush, bountiful field that sprawled forever, or you could end up in Helheim, which was just a terrible, cold, dismal place. Imagine spending your entire life in freezing Scandinavia, dying and then waking up in a different freezing afterlife. I would be so upset. Of course, if you didn't qualify for any of these afterlife options, you could always end up with your soul trapped on the earth and reanimated as a ghost or a corpse zombie monster called a draugr, which anyone who spent too much time inside of any of Skyrim's caves can tell you are a real nuisance. So Vikings had to come up with all sorts of ways to make sure that nobody came back to cause any problems for the village. No doubt you've heard of Viking funerary ships or their pyres, where their dead were sent off into the water in a long boat with possessions that might befit them in the afterlife, and then lit ablaze with an arrow. But oftentimes, that was more for higher caste members of society. Other burials were traditional, but the body was kept in the home for a few days to prepare. The Vikings took all sorts of fun precautions to make sure they wouldn't have a draugr on their hands. The head was wrapped in bandages. Oftentimes, the feet would be bound or sewn together, or even needles would be placed into the feet to make sure just in case they came back to life, they wouldn't be able to walk. Corpses were brought into houses feet first because they believed the spirit of the person would not be able to see where they were being taken for burial and thus unable to find their way back home. If they had the time too, Vikings would build something really fun called a corpse door, an opening they built into a home which was bricked up and when the burial was ready, would be smashed through and the dead would be carried through this feet first. The belief was that the reanimated could only enter their home from the way they had left, so if there was no corpse door anymore, the draugr wouldn't be able to get in and it would just sort of paw at the door like a sad cat. Honestly, the logic is there. This one makes complete sense to me. And number one, the Dorset Grave. The Dorset Mass Grave is one of the scariest and confusing archaeological discoveries ever discovered. Let me ask you, what's more fun than a barrel of monkeys? You might be thinking a barrel of Vikings? No, I'm thinking about a mass grave full of headless Viking bodies. No? Okay, well you and I find different things very fun, I suppose. Way back, way back, way back, all the way back in 2008, a group of archaeologists were on a fairly routine digging operation in Dorset, a quaint little seaside town in England. They were supervising a digging operation to improve local roads and were on set to see if there was anything of note to find. You know, maybe an old coin or an arrowhead. And for the first few days of the job, nothing noteworthy was really coming up until they came across the mass pile of 54 entangled Viking corpses all missing their heads. 
because I guess that was kind of noteworthy. If it was just a bunch of headless Viking bodies, that would be one thing. But the mass grave was just riddled in confusing details. Their skulls were missing, but as well, their rib cages, arm, and leg bones were all scattered around, surrounded by discarded teeth. There were no clothes or weaponry to be found at all. So what in Odin's name happened here because absolutely nothing I can imagine is pleasant. My first thought is that this was some sort of insane event horizon-esque scenario where a bunch of Vikings opened up a portal to hell and had a blood party. The teeth found around the grave had all been filed down neatly as if a craftsman had done it. Now it goes without saying that, you know, Viking dental surgery was not going to be a painless process, meaning this had to be excruciating, suggesting it was either done by a very careful tormentor or it was done to themselves to intimidate opponents by showing how gritty and fierce they are. Could not tell you which one is better. Now as good as my theory about a bunch of Vikings opening up a Hellraiser scenario or something is, archaeologists had some different ideas. They theorized that looking at the wounds on the ribs and the torso that they were very surgical blows, which isn't really what you'd expect from a rabid Viking brawl. The archaeologists thought that these men were either offered up as part of a horrifying sadistic ritual, or it was a big time mass sentencing where everybody was rounded up and sentenced to death. Explains too where all the weapons and gear had gone, as these men had been brought here and then left there for a very, very long time. Anyone else feel like that also kind of sounds like it might be the world's most terrifying puzzle to try and put together, trying to figure out where all those bones go? Maybe just me? Maybe I've been working on this channel too long and my sense of humor has been changed permanently. Starting off this countdown, we have Mary Todd Lincoln's dress. This beautiful dress was once owned by Mary Todd Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln's wife. It's a beautiful purple velvet dress with satin and lace detailing. She wore this dress during the Washington winter social season in 1861-62. to But here's the thing. After her husband's death, Mary went into mourning for a long period of time. In fact, she stayed in widow's clothes up until her own death in 1882. So she had no use for this dress anymore. So she gave this dress and some of her other items to her family members. This dress was given to her cousin Elizabeth Todd Grimsley. In 1916, Grimsley's son sold the dress to the Smithsonian's First Lady's Collection. And now, apparently, is haunted by Mary Todd herself. People have heard weeping when they have been near this dress. On a number of occasions, they have actually seen Mary Todd Lincoln's apparition by the dress. Thankfully, she means no harm. But if you think about it, it's quite sad. Even in the afterlife, she's still mourning over the loss of her husband. Hopefully, she can eventually find peace and reunite with him. Moving on to number four, we have the Smithsonian. One of the most haunted items in the Smithsonian is the museum itself. It is haunted by a number of ghosts. As a result, they actually offer ghost tours on location for people interested in the paranormal. On a number of occasions, workers have seen past Smithsonian scientists who would work on the collections there. But the most active ghost is that of the Smithsonian's first curator and second secretary, Spencer Fullerton Bard. Almost all of the night guards at the Smithsonian have seen his ghost wandering the halls. They see him gliding through the halls, people try to talk to him, and then he disappears into thin air. Then you have the ghost of Secretary Joseph Henry that also likes to show his face around town. According to the night guards, they said, and I quote, Henry is often seen fully clothed in the garments he wore in life, walking through the exhibits before returning to his post. His post being the statue the museum has in place for him. Dude, what in the night of the museum is this? Seriously. Then you have the countless unidentified entities that also haunt the halls. These are just like black shadowy figures people have seen in passing. At least it seems like these ghosts mean no harm. Like sure, it's kind of spooky, but at least they aren't malicious. Also, hit that thumbs up button if you want to see me go ghost hunting at the Smithsonian. I'm down. I'm down. Number three, the Hope Diamond. The Hope Diamond is one of the most famous diamonds in the world. The diamond originated in the Kollar mine in Andhra Pradesh, India. The history of the stone began when a French merchant traveler purchased the diamond, which was triangular in shape and crudely cut. He described the color as a beautiful violet. The stone was then sold to King Louis along with 14 other large diamonds and many smaller ones. The stone was then recut by the court jeweler. It was described by them as an intense steely blue, and the stone became known as the blue diamond of the crown, or the French blue. It was set in gold and hung from a neck ribbon, which was worn by the king on ceremonial occasions. The next king got the diamond reset, 
And then, when he and Marie Antoinette attempted to escape France in 1792, the diamond was stolen after being seized by the government. The stone was passed on to many, many people, being set in different jewelries and headpieces. Eventually, the stone would be displayed in several exhibitions for people to view worldwide. In 1958, the diamond was donated to the Smithsonian, quickly becoming the main attraction. Since its donation, the stone has only left the premises four times, once to the Louvre, once to South Africa at the Rand Easter Show opening, once to Harry Winston, and one other time to clean and restore the diamond. According to legend, the stone is cursed and will bring bad luck and misfortune to anyone who owns it. The curse is said to have come about when the original diamond was stolen from the eye of a statue. The thief who originally stole the stone met a grisly end, and owners of the diamond over the years have followed the same fate, being beheaded, executed, imprisoned, turned bankrupt, and many of their lives have ended abruptly at their own hands and often at someone else's. Since the diamond reached the Smithsonian, there have been no reports of the curse's effects, but I would suggest the only reason for that is no one wears it. I mean, if I got the chance, I have to say, I'd wear it. The thing is beautiful, and I would leave this life happy knowing that I had millions of dollars strapped around my neck, glittering and shining in a vibrant blue. Number two, Unlucky Mummy. The Unlucky Mummy is an ancient Egyptian artifact owned by the famous colonizers, the British. More specifically, it lies within the halls of the British Museum. The identity of the original owner is unknown. The artifact is described as a painted wooden mummy board of an unidentified woman and was obtained by the British Museum in 1889. The unlucky mummy is actually not a mummy at all. Instead, it is a gessoed and painted wooden inner coffin lid. It was found at Thebes and has been dated by its shape and style of decoration to the late 21st or the early 22nd dynasty. It is 162 centimeters in length and made of wood and plaster. The paint is placed on the plaster and hands protrude out of the mummy board. A nice 3D moment, you know? Its reputation for misfortune has been told for years, and many attribute large-scale disasters to the presence of the board. One story says the mummy was being moved from the British Museum to New York aboard the, yep, the Titanic, which, as you know, sank. Disclaimers surrounding the mummy's danger have even been published. One writer even conducted research into the history of the artifact, coming to the conclusion that the object had malevolent powers, and guess what? He passed away only three years later. The writer was very young and had no health concerns. His life ended at the mere age of 36. The mummy which the board belonged to has never been found, but many say that it was left in Egypt. I have to say, people keep taking things that don't belong to them, disturbing bodies that had been left undisturbed for thousands of years, and then they act all surprised when the stuff is cursed. I definitely put a curse on the lid of my coffin. Anyone who separates me and my coffin lid, or even pick me up from my resting place to move me into a fluorescent hellscape would definitely be sentenced to a fate of mediocrity and ignorant greed. Wait, oh my gosh. Anyone who does that is already both of those things. Things are starting to make a lot more sense now. Honestly, I love history, but at the same time, no, I don't. I don't need to know the genetic makeup of people 2,000 years ago. That won't help me. People just need to chill on the grave digging. Add that to the list of the top five weirdest, most unsettling things humans do. I could definitely make a highly controversial and opinionated video on that, which would likely get me canceled. It would also be like two hours long. <laughs> Number one, Cursed Ledger. A family in Kent donated this haunted book to Brighton's most haunted house, Preston Manor. They donated it after they were plagued by spectral visions and paranormal visitors. The shop ledger is from 1915, but was found trapped in the brick wall at a jeweler while a demolition was being performed in the 1980s. It was discovered by Tony Benovitz in 1988 when he was demolishing the Shoreland Fuchs shop, which had closed in 1984. He, for some reason, decided to bring the book home and it caused him and his daughter to suffer a myriad of paranormal hauntings, which they described as spirit visitations. His daughter, Josephine, claimed that images appeared in her rug, including a group of men, women, and children, and a soldier with a horse. She said that the spirits told her that the book had to be returned to Brighton for the anniversary of its first entry in December of 19. 
1915. The spirit's requests caused Josephine to phone Preston Manor, who sent a medium to visit the house. The medium confirmed that they sensed bad things emanating from it. Wow, specific. Josephine happily donated the ledger to the manor. She had no interest in keeping it to herself or even keeping it in her possession. Fair, I mean, I don't think I would want to keep it either, to be honest. The manor recalled their thoughts about the book, saying, at first, we weren't sure whether we'd take this apparently ordinary 100-year-old shop ledger, but the family impressed on us quite how scared they were of having the book in their keeping. When I had a phone conversation with Josephine, she seemed petrified. The book contained entries listed the jewelry sold from the shop it belonged to. After the book had been donated, Kent, the officer of Preston Manor, kept the ledger on her desk for a couple of weeks, but was unable to understand what exactly had happened to the book. Preston Manor holds several haunted items and is well known for the plethora of ghosts and spectral activities it contains. If you're a fan of getting haunted by the Lady in White or the Grey Lady, those are descriptive names, then you should definitely consider taking a trip to Brighton and Hove, East Sussex, to visit Preston Manor. They absolutely have their share of Victorian ghosts and haunted artifacts. Definitely a lot for the paranormal enthusiasts of the world to enjoy.